All right. So, we've made our way through the plant-eating dinosaur groups. So time for the good stuff. Um, okay, that's a little exaggeration. Plant-eating dinosaurs are cool in their own way. But these are my babies. Um, and as we get, especially to Friday's lectures, we're definitely in with my babies, uh, the Tyrannosaurus and their kid. But yes, yeah, so I work on theropods, and that's where we are starting now. And for the rest of the dinosaur diversity section, I should point out, keep an eye on the schedule. We've got another exam coming up. The second exam focuses on dinosaur origins and diversity. So the recent homeworks are a good, um, good set of examples of the sorts of information that you're going to be expected to know. Identify different groups of organisms, their adaptations, the particular traits, the evolution of those traits, their ecology, and so forth. OK, so theropoda. Uh, here is the cladogram for the base of theropoda. So this is the part of the tree we're going to cover today. Uh, and then the rest of dinosaurian diversity that we cover for the next several week, uh, lectures after that are all within this bar here. Uh, that said, 90%, more than 90% of all known dinosaur species are in here. Um, although the vast majority of those are from the Cenozoic era. Uh, but we'll see that the Solurosaurus we'll get to starting on Friday are vastly diverse. But this part of the tree is cool as well. Um, so when I introduced Saurischia before, when I talked about the rise of dinosaurs, that there's this hypothesis that um, this has been the standard model. It does look like it is the slightly superior uh, hypothesis, but not decisively so, about the basic arrangements among dinosaurs. And this is the hypothesis that sauropods and theropods so our potomorphs and theropods are each other's sister taxon with respect to ornithischians. Um, a number of recent studies have agreed with that and also agreed with a hypothesis that's been kicked around since, well, since the 80s, that uh, within Saurischia, we have an early branch that includes Herrerasaurus, a Triassic form, that isn't in the group with sauropodomorphs and theropods. And, a recent study out earlier this year, the most comprehensive so far, looks at this issue and it confirms that the Herrerasaurs do seem to be their own group uh, within Saurischia. So we've covered sauropodomorphs again. I'll talk a little bit about Herrerasaurs in a few slides just to remind you about them, but mostly we're going to be looking at theropoda here. So this is the part of the tree again we're looking at in this one, and yes, I know there's lots of traits here. Um, when you take a course with a professional and you get to the area of expertise, here's a, t a pro tip as a student. Expect to get more detail in that part of the course. It's just something that'll happen. When you're with a sociologist and they're in you get into their part of the, uh, the field, expect it. I'm going to tone it down more than I might otherwise, but expect there to be a lot of dense data in here. OK, so theropoda. Uh, the name means the beast-footed ones which isn't bad as such. Um, however, therion, uh, the root element in the thero part, is typically used in biology as a word element concerning mammals. So this could be read as mammal teeth. By the way, here's also a pro tip. Don't only write down what's on the slide to the bullet points. The words coming out of the faculty member is often the more important thing. OK, so um, it's um, a shame that when the guy wrote this, when Mosey Marsh gave the name, he didn't call these guys ornithopoda, because their feet are a lot more like birds than our ornithopod feet, for good reasons. OK, now, the beast-footed ones. They are, the majority of carnivorous dinosaurs are indeed theropods. However, it's worth noting, Herrerasauria and some other carnivorous dinosaurs may be basal saurischians. Um, and various theropods evolved non-flesh-eating diets. And I didn't point out here, but the basal branches of the other groups of dinosaurs were probably ancestrally carnivorous, although they later, of course, are dominated by herbivorous forms. Now, theropoda as a group, from the very smallest to the very largest, were obligate bipeds, the only major group of dinosaurs for which that's true. So we saw, you know, 
um, within sauropodomorpha, the evolution of obligate quadrupedality. Within ceratopsia, some obligate quadrupeds. Within thyreophorans, obligate quadrupeds. We saw in ornithopoda, maybe no obligate quadrupeds, but certainly facultative bipeds that spent most of their time on all fours. Theropods stayed on their hind legs throughout their history. The oldest theropods include some of the oldest dinosaurs um, from the earliest part of the late Triassic. There are some middle Triassic footprints, which are arguably from theropods, but only arguably. The youngest is, well, we'll see. And it's a group with tremendous diversity. And even if I wasn't a theropod worker, we could easily justify more lectures on theropods than the other groups for reasons we'll explore. So one of the traits that most theropods have are blade-like serrated teeth rather than philodont teeth. The technical term for blade-like is xiphodont, that means sword tooth or blade tooth. However, this is not a shared derived trait. This is a primitive trait for dinosauria. It may even be a primitive, in fact it is, a primitive trait for archosauria. It's sort of the default ancestral condition since early archosauriforms evolved a flesh-eating diet. So the difference here is that theropods retain, for the most part, xiphodont teeth, whereas the other groups of dinosaurs evolved something differently. And as I mentioned before, the basal members of the other groups of dinosaurs seem to be carnivorous as well. So uh, basal sauropodomorphs, like Buriolestes, a carnivore. Um, Herrerasaurs, shown here as a paraphyletic series, but they may be a monophyletic group, carnivores. Basal ornithischians, well, in this model, this is the model where the silosaurids are basal ornithischians and the basal more silosaurids of carnivore. Our expectation is that when we find the earliest branches of ornithischia, that they too will have been carnivorous. So, Herrerasaurs, this early branch of Herrerasaurs early predatory dinosaurs. So here we've got the uh, Herrerasaurus itself, which is the best known and the best studied of the Herrerasaurs, uh, is from the earliest late Triassic of, of Argentina. For a long time, it's been our best model, although we now have more forms from this part of the tree. And they do have traits in common with true theropods. Some of those are primitive traits, like blade-like serrated teeth. But we'll see some derived traits as well. However, they, they also lack, but they lack some derived traits shared by, by uh, sauropodomorphs and theropods. So. so we actually have, due to a recent study, what looks like a radiation of South American herrerasaurs. These have been known for a longer period of time and are much more completely known. But also, North American herrerasaurs. Uh, Demonosaurus uh, is over here, and down here is its skull. It's almost certainly uh, a juvenile. And Tawa. Tawa is an interesting form. It might be one of the most primitive true theropods, and some studies showed that. But this most recent study put it as part of this North American Herrerasaur radiation. It definitely has some traits that it shares with true theropods. Yeah. Because they are. I mean, that's, that has what, what was recovered. We don't know. It, the paper was 2021. Oh. So, you know, we just, it's just been recognized that this might be a radiation of a branch of two groups. We don't know yet. So here are the skulls of these two. Now, let's see some traits that actually make a true theropod a theropod. Some of these are found in Herrerasaurus, other ones are not. What trait? is the addition of a new opening in the face. So these are old openings we've seen before. The orbit, the nares, and between the two is the antorbital fenestra. But wait, what's that? Anterior to the antorbital fenestra is a little um, divot that go out to, pierces the skull called the promaxillary fenestra. And it represents another pouch of the sinus, the same sinus that occupies the antorbital fenestra. Now, it's not always preserved. Some groups, some groups of definite theropods lose it. We could say that much. 
Also, in some cases, it's difficult to see in lateral view, like Tyrannosaurus rex has it, but you can't see it from lateral view because of what happens in the front end of the maxilla. You have to kind of stand backwards and look forwards to see it, but it's there. Oh, I just said that. Sometimes it's absent or reduced. Sometimes it's hidden in lateral view. The intramandibular joint. So this is, we see from bottom to top, the lateral view of the mandible of a theropod, the medial view, so the tongue side view of the mandible of a theropod, and the same with the medial most bones pulled away. So this is the inside of the jaw. And you see that the dentary forms kind of a joint with the bones behind it. And there's a little bit of flexion there, side to side or up and down. This may have acted as a shock absorber when they've got their jaws clamped on a struggling prey item. It can help absorb some of that shock. It's not big enough. Some people want to thought maybe it allows the jaws to expand greatly and, and swallow bigger things. It doesn't work like that. It's not exactly like the snake jaw. But it probably is more of a shock absorber. It convergently evolved in some lizards, including snakes. They actually have an uh, intramandibular joint. And herrerasaurs. The interesting thing is that the geometry of some of the bones in the back of the jaw is different in herrerasaurs and in theropods. And so it does look like it's actually convergence rather than the inheritance of the same trait. So there is a small early late Triassic form from the same environment as Eoraptor and Herrerasaurus and Pisanosaurus called Eodromius. In fact, when it was first discovered, it was thought to be new specimens of Eoraptor, and that was later found to be a different animal. It's small. It's only about four feet long. It's carnivorous. And in that recent 2021 study, it turns out that this comes out as the oldest and most primitive theropod. Whether it stays there or not, we'll see, because other studies have put it closer to Herrerasaurus. But I would say it's, a, it's not a bad example. It's what we would expect an early theropod to look like, honest to goodness. Now, in some of the early theropods, and to be fair, also this creature Tawa, which in that recent study is a Herrerasaur, there's this structure called the premaxillary maxillary kink. So if you're following the jaw joint here, you get this sort of upwards divot between the premaxilla and the maxilla. Here it is in Tawa, a possible Herrerasaur. Here it is in the definite early theropod Coelophysis and a somewhat later early theropod Dilophosaurus. Now, often there's a large fang in the dentary around that area. And in modern crocodilians that have jaws that are sort of like that, that divot, that kink, is actually a spot they use to grapple on to long, slender objects, like fish or like the legs of antelope. And so these guys may have been doing the same. It may have been a spot they used to grab onto things. It gets lost in later theropods. Now, the theropods more derived than Tawa, basically Coelophysis and more derived forms, form a plate called Neotheropoda. And as opposed to the ambiguity of these earlier forms, neotheropods have this big collection of traits that makes them very recognizable. So we'll start from the front and work backwards. They have the furcula. We'll have a special slide about the furcula. But the furcula is the wishbone, the fusion of the clavicles, or maybe the elaboration of the interclavicle. Their ilium is expanded anteroposteriorly. And it is expanded anteroposteriorly to incorporate more sacrals. So neotheropods have five sacrals or more. The real reason, though, is the expansion of the hip muscles. The pubis and the ischium are very long and slender in neotheropods compared to other Sarisciens. To be fair, Tawa has that as well. You know, honest to goodness, I would not be surprised if the next round of analyses put Tawa as a basal non-neotheropod theropod. Um, Then there's the functionally tridactyl foot. I'll show you what that means in a bit, but that means a three-toed foot or a functionally three-toed foot. 
And it's not, there's no arrow to it here because I didn't want to get it too crowded. In the manus, in the hand, metacarpal 5 is lost. And so if you lose metacarpal 5, you don't have digit 5 either because, you know, where would digit 5 go? So they lose their pinkies and the bone to support the pinky. So neotheropods have four or fewer fingers. So on this, those two are neotheropods. Um, then we've got a, um, a non-neotheropod and some sauropodomorphs. So let's take a look at the furcula. In most dinosaurs, indeed in most vertebrates, we have paired clavicles. So a left and a right. In some sauropodomorphs, it looks like they might meet in the middle, but they're still separate bones. But in neotheropods, they're fused into a single bone. Or to be more precise, there is no evidence of paired clavicles, and there is a single bone that extends from one scapula corticoid to the other. I'll be a little fair there. Most of us interpret the furcula as the developmental fusion of what were once separate clavicles. But as I mentioned in the notes and I mentioned in class before, there is an alternative hypothesis. It is what a rare midline bone that's present in earlier reptiles that expands and replaces the clavicle. For this class, we're saying the fused clavicles. Now, the furcula, or wishbone, because that's what it is, the wishbone that's present in birds, um, in modern birds has a function, and it's an energy spring. And in birds, when they uh, compress their, their wings down, it stretches out, and then it releases energy, so they don't have to use as much energy to raise their wings again. So compression, spring back. Compression, spring back. Well, these worms aren't flying. These early theropods are not flying around. So that's not what's going on. But maybe it had a similar function in that it acted as a shock absorber or a brace for the activity of the forelimbs, which in this case is grasping onto prey. So comparable to the intramandibular joint. So here is Allosaurus and the arrow at its furcula. The funny thing is the furcula had been found on specimens of, of theropods back in the, 19, uh, the 1800s, the 19th century. But paleontologists failed to recognize it as such because they knew the only animals that had furculae were birds. And why would you look for a bird trait in a big carnivorous dinosaur. Well, they eventually found out why. Well, they didn't find out why, they were dead. We eventually found out why. And there's, again, the furcula in Allosaurus. This is the specimen that you'll see when you go to the Smithsonian. By the way, of course, when you're planning on going to the Smithsonian, keep your eye on what's going on with regard to the metro. Right now, because you've probably seen in the news, if, if you've been paying attention, they're, they're a bit, because of an act, a recent accident, uh, they're think, keeping things really slow, and the metro system is sort of delayed at the moment. It's, it's still working, but it's delayed. Looking again at the manus, the hand. So we're looking at a bunch of left hands here. So here's an ornithischian. We've got one, two, three, four, five, the ancestral dinosaurian hand. Reduced digits four and five. Reduced metacarpals four and five. We've got digits on all fingers. Here are some sort of potomorphs. We see all of them there. Herrerasaurs and Tawa, which in the latest study, we would move these guys over here. They still have metacarpal 5. But when we get to this part of the tree, we've lost metacarpal 5. Now, in the foot, a functionally tridactyl or three-toed foot, which is why calling these guys beast feet is OK, because they've got big claws, but bird feet would be better. Um, so we look at something like a uh, Guaibasaurus up there, which is a sauropodomorph, or maybe it's a basal theropod, or a herrerasaur, and herrerasaurus itself. In all these forms, metacarpal, oh, sorry, metatarsal one is fairly long, it contacts the ankle, and that toe is a weight-bearing bone. But in neotheropods, metatarsal one is dinky. It's greatly reduced. It does not touch the ankle. So it's just a little bone down here. It doesn't go all the way up to the ankle. 
And the digit, even if it contacts the ground, is not a weight-bearing bone. So functionally, these guys are three-toed animals. They're walking on digits two, three, and four. And that gives them the very distinctive three-toed footprints. So let's take a look at some of the diversity. The first branch of neotheropods to be successful were these guys, the coelophysoids, named after this particular taxon, this particular genus, coelophysis. They show up in the late Triassic. They're pretty common worldwide in the late Triassic and the early Jurassic. They tended to be relatively gracile. Gracile is a term in anatomy for slender. So you see long neck, long tailed. They're not too heavily built. At the time they lived, particularly for the early ones, remember that's the Triassic. That's a world dominated by Pseudosuchians. So they're not the apex predators. It's the big croc relatives that are the apex predators at this time. Some coelophysoids are about one meter long. And remember that basic dinosaurian aspect. Half that length is tail, so that leaves half a meter. So a foot and a little more than a foot, than a foot and a half. Half that remaining length is probably neck and head. So we're talking those one meter ones are the size of a turkey, if that. A big chicken, a goose. Others, like Coelophysis itself, are on the you know, 10 to 13 foot length, 3 to 4 meters. A few possible Coelophysoids are up in the 5 meter range, 16 and a half or so feet. They're possible because they might be sort of the, they might be Coelophysoids, they might be part of the next phase or the transition to the next phase. One thing that is known is that at least a couple of species of Coelophysoid both from the late Triassic and the early Jurassic, died in groups and presumably lived in groups at least part of their life cycle. Um, so, you know, not herds. Herds we normally use for plant eaters. These things have zygodont teeth. So flocks, packs. Um, this is from the mass death site in um, New Mexico, Ghost Ranch, uh, New Mexico, where literally hundreds and possibly greater than that of individuals of Coelophysis itself were found buried together. And so here we see a pack of Coelophysis wandering through the, the not yet petrified forest. It will eventually be the petrified forest. But as I said, these guys lived in the shadow of the Pseudosuchians. So here we see the, the scale with some of the other, with the apex predators of their environment. But then the Triassic-Jurassic extinction you know, the eruptions of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province takes out the world of the Pseudosuchians, the Therapsids get knocked back, the dinosaurs have no competition, and out of this phase of theropods, we now grow the apex predators. So the next phase, um, we see some changes. From now on until the lectures Next week, the basal members of most groups are typically around five to six meters long. Some of them may then get bigger, or some might get smaller. But the early branches are about typically about the same size. And they typically have fewer but larger maxillary teeth. So here you see two forms, um, Dupesaurus from the Lake Triassic, Dilophosaurus from the early Jurassic, and note, compare the maxillary teeth. Far fewer, but a lot more, sorry, far fewer, but a lot bigger teeth in Dilophosaurus than in the Triassic form. Now, the next phase of theropod evolution is sometimes called Dilophosauridae. But, despite what some of us once thought, including me, it looks like it's not a clade. That the dilophosaurids aren't a group. That it's sort of a phase of, you take something sort of like the coelophysis, you make it bigger, and that is the radiation out of which all later theropods evolved. So these are in that sort of five to seven meter range, like dilophosaurus there or Sinosaurus there from China. 
In the early Jurassic, this is the first time that dinosaurs were the dominant predators. And here we can actually see Dilophosaurus compared to a contemporary, although from another part of the world, Heterodontosaurus. So Dilophosaurus, its main claim to fame with the general public is it showed up in the first Jurassic Park movie, except every single thing about it was wrong other than making it flesh eater. First of all, you can see how big that is. You know, Heterodontosaurus there is about four feet long. So this is the creature that eats Newman um, from Seinfeld. Uh, it's the spitter. It's as long as a Suburban. It could not easily get into a Suburban or a Jeep, whatever the vehicle was that they used. Um, it's big. There's no evidence it's spit poison. There's no evidence of the frill. Uh, basically, almost every aspect of it is wrong. And it's got this prominent premaxillary maxillary kink, which is not there in the model they used. So it ate. It did eat meat. It did walk on its hind legs. And it did have crests. That much they got right. And indeed, most of the theropods in this part of the tree have some kind of crest. Here's Cryolophosaurus from, uh, from Antarctica, where its crests are sort of uh, oriented that way rather than down the length of the skull. So here we see some of those early forms of, uh, of dilophosaur grade dinosaurs. But that phase peters out before the end of the early Jurassic. And they are displaced by their more derived descendants. The more derived descendants collectively are called avarostra, bird faces or bird snouts. Avarostrans first show up in the later part of the early Jurassic. And from the middle Jurassic onward, they are the apex predators of the world. At least until the end of the Cretaceous. Again, the primitive forms, and we see here primitive versions of the two major clades, shown about the scale, are in the five to eight meter range. And I think you can see from this, uh, these drawings, in both cases, they're more powerfully sculled than the earlier theropods. So the skulls are getting better adapted at you know, delivering killing bites. And within Averostra, are two major divisions. Ceratosauria, represented here by Ceratosaurus, <laughs> and Tetanurae, represented here by Monolophosaurus. Also worth showing that at the base of both of these clades, as well as in the Dilophosaur grade, yeah, as I said, crests were in. So these guys have all sorts of crests and hornlets and so forth on the head, probably for display. So we'll start with Ceratosauria. If you see the older literature, you may see the clade here referred to as Neoceratosauria, because for a long time, those of us who worked on theropods found that coelophysoids were closer to these guys than they were to tetanurians, and collectively that whole group of Ceratosauria, but we were wrong. At least all the analyses in the 21st century have shown, no, we were wrong. One thing that unites Ceratosaurs is the reduction of the manual phalanges. Their fingers become really small. There's other traits on the, um, in the lecture notes, but you're not, you're not responsible for those. You want to have them there for completeness. They show up in the later part of the early Jurassic, and ceratosaurs survive to the end of the Cretaceous. This is the actual, um, the original specimen of ceratosaurus. You will see a cast of the specimen on display at the Smithsonian. It's a cast because they put it in a rather dynamic position and they don't want to have uh, the original bones. They couldn't really mount them in that way. So here's the hand. Here's the hand of that specimen. And it's not complete, but you can see how stubby these fingers are. You know, those finger bones, the phalanges. And then you know, there'll be a couple more phalanges on here, but not many. They're really stubby hands. This is true of other types of um, ceratosaurs, too. Here's one of the oldest but extremely incomplete. The stuff in red is what is known. So extremely incomplete ceratosaur, but from the very beginning of the uh, ceratosaur radiation. And at that point, it does look like its fingers are actually a little bit bigger. So the stuff is that's in whatever, pink? Salmon pink? I don't know what color you want to call that. That's what's actually known of the hand, and a restoration of it. But later forms are much more stubby fingered. It shows, though, that theropods were getting bigger as we get to Averostra. So you see in the colors, in the, the colors here, these are the dilophosaur grade forms. 
and in black is sultry of the nadir. So we get to a nadir rostrum, and they're a little bigger and more massive. So Ceratosaurus itself is a good example of the next sort of more derived Ceratosaurus. That's the animal after which the clade is named. And many of the later ones, as you see, have these powerful skulls. But not all of them do. Because as I mentioned before, we start with relatively big forms, but sometimes we have evolution of small forms within that. And within one of the clades of ceratosaurs, called Noasauridae, we get some really small ones. It's the first example we have in theropods of size reduction. So there's um, some noasaurs are quite small. They're just about two meters long, six and a half feet. Some get much larger. And there are some dinosaurs, which I'll get to after we talk about noasaurs a bit, which are actually quite large, but it's not certain that they're noasaurs. And within this clade are two major subdivisions. A group that's found mostly in the Jurassic called Elaphrosaurinae, which are larger and really well adapted to fast running. And another group that's best known from the Cretaceous called the Noasaurines. And we see the, represent the, name, uh, we see the representatives of both clades here. So let's take a look at them in a little bit. So Noasaurinae, mostly from the southern continents. They're known from the Cretaceous. Here is Mashikasaurus, the best known of them, most completely known of them. It's a gracile, a slender form. And a weird thing about them is their jaws. I remember, well, 20 years ago or so, when the lower, when this, the lower jaw of the specimen was first discovered, and the scientists who found it in Madagascar were, um, went to the conference, the our annual conference, and they were showing it around and trying to, to figure out what it is, and none of us had any idea. And, that doesn't make sense because no one had ever found a uh, Noah sorted skull at that point. So, so look at those teeth at the front of the dead ape and inferred in the front of the premaxilla, this forward pointing teeth. What's that for? Well, the most complete Noah sorted has yet to be named. It was discovered it's from the uh, mid Cretaceous of Niger. Uh, this is the skeleton. And let's take a look at something here. That's the arm. So look, this is actually an, articulate, an excellent articulated specimen. There's no question that that's the arm of it. And look, that's the shoulder girdle, humerus, radius, ulna, and hand. Compare that dinky little arm to like the legs and the torso. So tiny, 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 tiny little arm. There it is again. That's a trait we see in a lot of the Cretaceous ceratosaurs, both this group and another group we're going to get to. The other major group of Noasaurid are the Elaphrosaurines that might survive into the Cretaceous. These are very gracile, and they have extremely elongated, stretched out hind limbs. The ones for which we have skulls, which granted is one genus so far, <laughs> have a toothless beak, at least as adults. So this is a group of theropods. The theropods are the carnivorous dinosaurs, but these guys are probably not carnivores. So our first time we bump up against plant-eating, meat-eating dinosaurs. That's OK. That's nature for you. And think about it. The panda, what does a panda eat? Bamboo. It's a member of a group called carnivora. So it is a herbivorous carnivora. So having herbivorous meat-eating dinosaurs, not a bad thing. It turns out baby elaphrosaurines have teeth. These are sort of medium-sized and where known, the foreland shows that it's, it's pretty reduced. So um, here's Elaphrosaurus, the name-bearing form. It's a large one. In fact, it's shown about life size, as I projected here. Really long, slender legs. We won't see legs this long and slender until some of the really cool dinosaurs evolve them in the Cretaceous. Here it is in side view. So the skull is unknown, so they had to sort of do a generic theropod head. If they were to redo this mount, they probably would take the skull off. Or they probably would take the teeth out because of this creature, known from really good specimens. Um, and that's the hand. And it doesn't even have a thumb. It's lost its thumb. 
it has maybe a tiny bit of a ring finger, and the other finger is super supple. So there's a reconstruction of Linosaurus. And as I mentioned, juvenile Linosaurus actually have teeth. But as they get older, they lose the teeth. And it's not just like you know, human beings losing their teeth when they get you know, really old. This is basically as they reach adulthood, they lose their teeth. And it suggests that the babies ate a lot more flesh and that they switched to a herbivorous or at least omnivorous diet as they got older. A good example of a pattern that happens a lot in dinosaur history of a shift in your ecological niche with ontogeny. We saw that also with like the baby diplodocids having a very different diet than the adults. There is a new noosaurid, not yet named, from the early Cretaceous of France um, that the describers are not willing to admit is a noosaurid. Uh, they keep on claiming, uh, the French family talks about one, keep on claiming it's an ornithomimosaur, a group we're going to talk about on, on Friday, and those of us who specialize in theropods, we see the people, no, it's a noosaur, it's an elaphrasiori noosaur, but we'll see. It's not officially out yet, but yeah, question. Wouldn't that mean that elaphrasiori uh, young would have to hunt by, basically by themselves? Presumably, yes, they would have to hunt on their own, um, maybe under the protection of the adults, because we're talking about small-bodied animals here. So sort of like you know, an ostrich, an ostrich looks after its young, but it doesn't necessarily catch food for it. So the babies might be going after lizards while the, the parent is looking around for uh, predators. So um, the, oh, so we're talking about this. I was just going to yeah. ask about Vespersaurus, but right. um, in this diagram, it's like it's walking on its middle. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting there. We're getting there. So, one aspect of um, noosaur, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, elaphrosaurines in general, uh, uh, noosaurids in general, is that they have even more emphasis of the middle toe than the side toes than any other theropod. And recent discoveries show that a specialized one from later in the Cretaceous is really reducing the side toes, so they're probably not really doing much weight bearing at all. These are becoming one-toed animals. And if you remember when I talked about correlated progression, when I talked about evolution, and I gave the example of the evolution of horses from having four toes to three toes to one toe, this is a group of, of meat-eating dinosaurs, or maybe meat-eating dinosaurs, um, of theropods, that seem to be evolving monodactyly. And in fact, there are trackways from around the same time and place that look like they are monodactyl, single-toed single animals in terms of the functional walking, which is kind of cool. You know, maybe if time had gone by, they would lose their side toes the way horses did. Now, a total mystery is a group, a possible group, called Bahariasaurids. Don't worry about them. This is just for your, this is just for your education. This is not, I'm never going to put this on a test. Just because you see bullet points on the screen doesn't mean it's always important for a test. We just want to talk about it. Okay, so, Bahariasaurids. Fossil, this, a meter scale. Fossils from, I think that's 50, okay, from Belicho, that's a 50, cent, a 50 centimeter scale. Um, from the Cretaceous of South America and Africa, none of them known from anything like a complete skeleton. The stuff in white is what's known. But they show a bunch of traits that are found in common. The big specimens look to be the size of tyrannosaurs. They're gracile. The forelimbs are dinky. Look at how small they are. The skulls, utterly unknown. No one has found a skull element of these animals ever. One thought is they're related to a group well, I'll mention on Friday called the Megaraptorids. Another thought is these are giant elaphrosaurines or near elaphrosaurines. They, you know, they've got reduced hands, but in a totally different way than any other ceratosaur. In fact, it looks a lot like a tyrannosaur hand, but they're not tyrannosaurs. When they were first discovered, people assumed that they were big flesh-eating dinosaurs, but that's before we knew that elaphrosaurines probably weren't. So here is a meter scale down here. Picture this giant beaked Critter, the one in gray, running around in northern Africa in the middle of the Cretaceous. 
Weird. Okay, that's Bahari Assortance. These guys, important. Abelia Assortance. Show up in those Jurassic of Gondwana. Maybe. And then in Gondwana, the southern continents, and in Europe and the Cretaceous, they're really common. And in the later part of the late Cretaceous, in Gondwana and Europe, they're the apex predators. They're the top dog, well, top dog. They have really reduced forelimbs. So I mean, you can see that here. They have relatively small tooth size. Doesn't mean that they were weak bites, but they had small teeth size and rounded skulls. So probably a really forceful bite, a bite that uh, generated a lot of force. And many of them have thickened skull domes, thickened skull roofs. In fact, when the top of the head of Majungasaurus was first found, and they didn't have the association of that with the rest of the skeleton, they thought it was a gun, the first discovered Gondwan and Pachycephalosaur. And then subsequently found the rest of the skulls and whoops, we were wrong. So here's a form from the Jurassic, which may or may not be a true abelisaur. The name is Abelisaur of Dawn. Uh, and it shows that the hand is greatly reduced, but the arm isn't super short yet. So this is scaled so that the humera, so the femora are all the same length to each other. It's going to be the proportion of the arm and Dilophosaurus in a later abelisaurid, and then this early abelisaur. We actually have a lot of different abelisaurids now. Some have very long, slender feet, very similar in some ways to, say, tyrannosaurus, we'll see later on. You know, here's this more rounded skull, a little deformed. But, uh, and here's a look at a bunch of different abelisaurids to give you a sense of the variety. Here's Scorpio venator. And then those arms. So here it is in, oh, it should be the Jungasaurus. I forgot to update this. The Jungasaurus over here. Here it is in Carnotaurus. The Humerus. Uh, I think I've got an animation here. Yeah, Humerus. The radius and ulna. And the metacarpals. The forearm has shrunk it up, so the forearm is a wrist. The radius and ulna are essentially metacarpals. So basically, it has a, an upper arm bone and a hand. So. For all the jokes that tyrannosaurs get about having useless forearms, and I will show you a bunch of cartoons of those on Friday, the Bailey sorted arms were vastly more useless. However, both tyrannosaurs and a Bailey swords could laugh at us. They may have had useless arms, uh, but our bites are insignificant to what they used. They didn't need arms to do what they did. Okay, all the remaining new dinosaurs that I'll talk about in the course are tetanurines. So the group tetanure means stiff tail. A group that shows up in the middle Jurassic and continues onward. As opposed to their ceratosaur cousins who reduce the hand, in tetanurines they enlarge the hand. The name comes from the increased stiffening between the individual caudal bones, individual tail vertebrae. I'll show examples of that coming up. And within it, there's a bunch of basal forms, and then a derived group called the Orionides, the hunters, like Orion the hunter. So here we see a Piatnitskisaurus, an early representative, which is, you can see, prowls. Um, shopping malls in Argentina. So the interlocking caudals. Projections from off of the neural arch that extend forward and backwards help lock the caudals together. Now, all, all dinosaurs have these projections. All tail vertebrates do. I'll also tell tetrapods at least. But in this case, they extend far enough forward and back that they stiffen the base of the tail. Here's more extreme. You can see how far forward these projections are going to lock on to the vertebra in front of them. Now, functionally, we see something similar in an analogous situation in big cats. Now, the cats don't have these long prongs, but instead they can stiffen the tail with muscles so that the posterior parts of the tail are stiff 
Well, they keep it very mobile at the base, and they use it to swing that tail back and forth as a dynamic stabilizer to be able to turn more quickly while they're chasing something. It turns out some of the small ornithopods independently evolved this. So it's probably an adaptation towards agility. So what are some other tetan earning traits? So we've seen the orbit, the antorbital fenestra, the nerus. There's the promaxillary fenestra. And now there's a new opening between the promaxillary fenestra and the antorbital fenestra called the maxillary fenestra. Why wasn't, you know, why did it get this name? This was actually named first, and the promaxillary fenestra was named later. Um, so yet another uh, opening for these sinuses in the face. All right, so here's an early tetanurine, monolophosaurus, a good example of one. There's the skeleton. Within the tetanurines are two major branches, the megalosauroids and the carnosaurs. And I'll probably do a recording with the carnosaurs, at least the second half of it, because i got some things to say about megalosauroids before we finish up here. So megalosauroids tend to have elongated snouts, either primitive forms like over here in a megalosaurid, or a really long stretched out snout, like in Spinosaurus. And although having a big thumb claw is a Sauriscian trait, having a ginormous thumb claw is a megalosauroid trait. Technical term, ginormous. So within megalosauroids, there seems to be this primitive group of megalosaurids and some even more primitive branches and then the highly specialized and famous spinosaurids. Megalosauroids begin in the Middle Jurassic, and in fact, during the Middle Jurassic, are among the apex predators. And they survive until the middle part of the late Cretaceous, with the last of the spinosaurs. So this just gives us a sense of some of the early ones. They're rather generic looking. The megalosaurids themselves are, quite frankly, rather generic looking. Here's Afrovenator from the Middle Jurassic of Niger. You struck the Spondylus from the early late Jurassic of uh, England. This is actually it's a, a sub adult, a teenager. Here are adults, Megalosaurus itself, slightly later than that, closer to us in time, is Torvosaurus. And here's a baby, Cyromenus. The intriguing thing about Cyromenus, which you can't see so well in this illustration, or this photograph, is that the tail has preserved around it long plumes coming off of it, long fuzz. The name actually means squirrel mimic. But it's a baby. It's a hatchling. This animal could probably grow up to 10 meters long as an adult. So a squirrel mimic. That's 33 feet long. But, um, and is our basal most evidence in theropods of the presence of fuzz. But quite frankly, we don't have skin impressions further down below this, at least from lake deposits. So here's an illustration of one that's feeling very wet in Germany in the late Jurassic. And so it might be that its cousins, like you know, Megalosaurus itself, were quite fuzzy. We just don't have the fossils, the skin, to show that yet. Now, the most famous branch of Megalosauroids, and I'll try to get us through as much of them as I can before we have to go. Um, are the Spinosauridae. Spinosaurids are a major group of carnivore in the early through late Cretaceous of Europe, Gondwana, and Asia. But for some reason, known but to dinosaurs, we don't have any evidence of them in North America. Some tooth evidence suggests they're present in the late Jurassic, but more recent studies said those are actually ceratosaur teeth. Spinosaurids have long crocodile-like snouts and cone-shaped teeth, like the teeth of crocodiles. And their name comes from their elongated neural spines. So here is a skeleton of a pretty good early one, Suchomimus, the crocodile mimic. Here's the skull, a restored skull of Spinosaurus itself. No one has ever found a complete Spinosaurus skull. This takes bits and pieces of a couple different ones. 
And you can see it's a rather croc-like snout. I should point out as it spins around, that's the nerus. So you can see how far back the nerus is on the skull. And here are those gigantically elongated neural spines. So there's a meter scale at the bottom. So some of the neural spines on Spinosaurus would be taller than you are. Now, I will record the rest of the Spinosaurids and the Carnosaur information uh, after I get back to my office so that we stay up to date so that on Friday we start with Silurosaurus. Make sure you watch it. There's going to be some cool stuff in there. Um, and I will see you guys later.